Right, now we need to move on. Um, this is similar territory, but now we're looking at uh, not just two slits, but hundreds if not thousands of slits. Uh, and this is something that we're going um, that we're going to spend a bit of time on because it's quite an important topic, the diffraction grating. Now I'm only going to talk about transmission diffraction gratings, but they actually work in reflection as well. In fact, most instruments that use these things uh, will use them uh, in reflection to avoid just to avoid the absorption of light going through. Um, and what we'll see, is that if we put light onto a diffraction grating, uh, and it's normally, that's the way we're going to think about it, so in other words it's coming at right angles to this grating here, we will see that we get a, a pattern the other side where we get our <coughs> n equals zero thing through here, and then we get essentially bright uh, fringes to either side, and dark fringes, uh, that are in very specific positions and we can calculate those positions. All right? So we get first order, second order, third order on both sides and fourth and fifth and so on, however many it is. So just to show you what this looks like in practice, I'm going to take the light off again. Uh, this is a diffraction grating. It is just a series of dark lines, very closely spaced dark lines on this slide. Okay. And in fact, there are 600 lines per millimeter on here, all right? So there's an awful lot of lines. So I'm going to shine light normally on the surface, and you'll see what happens, right? We get a straight through, and then we get orders of bright fringes, spots in this case, because my light source happens to be a spot coming out either side, all right? Let's take it closer so I can bring these in a little bit so we can see. Well, roughly, I can see the central one and orders one and two on either side. Yeah? Um, and so this is a diffraction grating, an example of a diffraction grating. And that is essentially what I've just tried to show you on all the other side in terms of what happens. Okay, now. It's really important because it enables dispersion because uh, the angle at which we get a bright fringe coming out in our different orders depends on the wavelength. All right, so red light is going to go round for the first order to a higher angle than blue light would. Still first order, but first order for a particular wavelength. So this is why these things are actually really quite useful in terms of scientific instruments. You won't find prisms being used now to disperse light in a spectrometer, for instance, simply because it means you've got to pass your light through a great chunk of glass. Lots getting absorbed on the way. You use a diffraction grating instead, far, far more efficient. Uh, and the other thing to notice is that we get more dispersion as we go to higher orders. Right? It's spreading them out wider. So we've now got a way of uh, determining whether, well, you know, do we want less dispersion but more intensity, brighter spots, or do we want, you know, can we cope with lower intensity because we want to spread things out much more widely and therefore be more sensitive to different particular wavelengths. <coughs> so the new stuff that's being talked about currently, for instance, to look at, to try and look at, um, the atmospheres around exoplanets, which is basically just optical spectroscopy analysing the wavelengths, uh, is going to be based on using a diffraction grating, right? It will be a rather expensive version of one of these to disperse the light and therefore to determine what wavelengths are present, what dark absorption lines are present in that spectrum, etc., etc. So basically to look for chemical signatures. Uh, in, in the light that's coming out. Um, all the infrared, ultraviolet and so on spectrometers that we've got in the department, in the teaching labs and in research labs and so on, are all based on using diffraction gratings to analyse the wavelengths, to disperse uh, what's coming out. So this is actually quite an important um, topic here. And the formulation is essentially the same as when we talked about diffraction. 
uh, we actually talked about it last term and this term in terms of crystal structures, that sort of thing. All right, it's the same sort of process. But here we've got our incident wave coming into our grating, which remember is just a whole series of slits next door to each other. Uh, and it's coming in normally, so it's coming in at right angles. And then if you draw it, you can draw it up in this case in terms of these Huygens secondary wavelets thing. So we get basically directions out of here. This is one particular angle where we've got constructive interference. A bright fringe will appear if we look at that particular angle. I don't know what that might be. The first order, for instance. Um, <coughs> at another angle, we get less intensity. And then we get round to the second order, whatever angle that might be, and we get uh, a bright fringe again. And it's all just to do with uh, how these uh, diffracted waves coming through each individual slit are overlapping on the far side. Are we getting constructive or destructive uh, interference? So if we take any two of those slits and we look at whatever that angle might be to give us constructive interference, it's exactly the same sort of trigonometry we use when we looked at diffraction. Right? And you remember for diffraction, uh, we came up with something called Bragg's Law. Yes? And that told us that in our, the case of crystal structures, the spacing between <coughs> layers of atoms at particular angles will give us constructive interference, a bright spot. Right? It's the same approach here. The difference here is that where, where we had a crystal, we were looking at, uh, if you remember, interference between what was essentially reflected light of planes of uh, atoms in our crystal. So in other words, we were worried about in, uh, incoming and outgoing angles. In this case, our incoming angle happens to be 90 degrees. We're coming in normally to the diffraction rating. So we're only worried about the angles on the far side. And you'll see how that comes out uh, when you work through the whole thing in, in detail. So here's the setup again. Here's whatever angle it is for first order, second order or something, but a bright fringe on the other side. So constructive interference. Here's the little right angle triangle that we were set up. So very, very similar to our diffraction uh, analysis last term. And all we've got to determine for this <coughs> to be a bright fringe is that this length here, in other words the difference in path length between light coming from this slit and this slit is a whole number of wavelengths. Right? Y has to be n lambda. Right? It's down there on the slide. But we also know what Y is because we've got a little right angle triangle here so we can write it in terms of the gap between the two slits and the angle basic trigonometry again, exactly as we had before, but you'll notice the key difference. Because we're coming in at right angles here, uh, and not at the same angle we're coming out the other side, which is essentially what we have for our crystal, we lose that factor of two. Alright, so we move from Bragg's diffraction equation, which is what's on the board now, to our transmission diffraction grating equation. We're just losing that factor of two. So this angle now is the angle associated with whatever order of bright fringe it is we're looking at on the other side. So don't confuse those two equations. I put them on the board purposefully because I want you to get the difference between them. Bragg's equation is associated with diffraction from crystals. So we've got angles of incidence and angles of, of uh, diffraction to worry about. In this case, our angle of incidence is always going to be 90 degrees. So this is our master equation for a transmission grating. And it's what determined where those bright spots were on the wall. And I put the laser pointer through, uh, through that grating. Now, this is a technical point. You, and I'm going to give you calculations where you have to handle this because everything 
that you will use uh, in the labs or in you know your professional life later maybe uh, will be down in this form. So these two gratings I've got, one of them says it's 100 lines per millimetre, the other one says it's 600 lines per millimetre. And that is the way you'll buy them. And rule of thumb, the more lines per millimetre, the more expensive it's going to be. For fairly self-evident reasons, I would have thought. It's much harder to get 600 lines per millimetre uh, on a surface than it is to get one. So this is the figure that's going to be quoted. Sorry, lines per millimetre is the figure that's going to be quoted. You will need to do this conversion, in other words, to work out what lowercase d is, the spacing between any two of the slits on the grating. Okay, So you're going to have to be prepared for that, I'm afraid. That is historical, but it's still there, so you're going to have to deal with that. Last time, you remember, we finished with um, our look at diffraction gratings. And today we're going to move on to uh, interferometers, <coughs> which are quite an important topic, actually, in terms of... So I'm just waiting for phone usage to... Um, <coughs> Um, interferometers are quite important in science because they enable us to measure some things really, really precisely. And they're basically set up to exploit the phenomenon of, of interference, uh, as we'll see. So, you know, an early example was, was the work that was done by uh, Michelson and Morley back in the late 19th century. And, you know, that was the first time anyone had been able to demonstrate uh, reliably and accurately with enough precision uh, that the speed of light is the same in all directions uh, to begin to force the physics community I suppose to move away from uh, believing that Newtonian physics was the be all and end all of everything uh, and it actually began to usher in uh, the work that eventually led to, um, uh, to what I guess we'd now refer to as relativistic physics, so Einstein's theories and, and the theories of a lot of other people uh, around <coughs> that time as well. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to dwell on this, but the essence of it is that it enabled the measurement of changes, and changes in, in position or length in particular, to incredible levels of precision. Um, you know, even a basic modern interferometer will enable you to measure changes in, in uh, distance to about 10 to the minus 13 of a metre. Right, so way smaller than a diameter of an atom. Uh, so this is really precise stuff, and in fact, you know, the, the, the ultimate, and I'll tell you about this in a little bit, uh, in a few slides' time, uh, the ultimate sort of precision machines will, will get better than this. Um, so we're really talking about machines now that become limited uh, almost by the therm just the thermal noise effects in the surfaces of, of the components. So slight variations in the positions of atoms and so on. So amazing precision. Uh, have you all come across the Microsoft Morley experiment before? Or none of you come across it before? Okay. I mean, it's quite, it's a classic sort of thing, really. In the, you know, before this sort of work began and came to, to maturity, um, it was fairly common belief that waves needed a medium to travel through any waves, including electromagnetic waves. So in order for light to reach us from the sun, there must be something between us and the sun. I mean, that's how it went. Uh, and this all-pervasive medium was called the ether. All right? So out there in space, in all reaches of the universe, uh, we had the ether. And that was the, that was the postulation. And it was through the ether that light and so on travelled. Um, but if that's the case... Sorry, I need to try and... I didn't bring my little pack of stuff down, so I'm down to fingernail fragments of chalk today. Um, it always amuses me, that box. It's a collection of tiny, tiny pieces <coughs> of almost useless chalk. Um, but you can imagine the situation. We've got the, you know, the sun here and, you know, in some sense, the Earth... I know my drawing skills once again. Uh, the Earth is orbiting around the sun, somewhat wobbly. Um, but if we've got through all of this space 
a medium through which everything is moving, then, well, I don't know, it's relative motion with respect <coughs> to the sun, say. Let's just, just postulate that the ether respect, with respect to the sun is moving in that direction. Actually, it doesn't matter. It could be static for this experiment still to work. Because what we do is set up an interferometer on the planet, right? which is what Michelson and Morley did. They use this precise length scale in order to measure the speed of light, essentially. Right? You can do that experiment yourself. It's dead easy. I'll try and set it up for you with microwaves next week, if you like. Amazingly easy to do. Uh, you can do it with a microwave oven, actually, if you want to. Um, you need some chocolate buttons to sprinkle on the plate in the bottom. Uh, <coughs> I'll tell you how to do that, if you want. I mean, it's really, really easy. Um, and you get quite a good estimate, actually, for the speed of light. You should, if you do it carefully enough, you should get at least within 10% of, of, of the value. So it's not bad. So anyway, we've measured the speed of light over here. All right? If we measure it again here, right, different positions in the, in the orbit, in other words, different times of the year, we're actually, whatever the ether is doing, we're moving in a different way compared to it. So if Newton was right, then the speed of light would change depending on the speed of the ether with respect to the Earth where we're doing our observations. So this was a killer blow for uh, Newtonian physics in that sense because they found wherever they measured it in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, whatever time of year, in other words, the speed of light came out to be exactly the same. So it wasn't having added to it or taken away from it the relative speed of the Earth with respect to the, to the ether through which these waves are travelling. So anyway, that's a, an aside. Uh, it's not part of the syllabus, but you might as well know that there's some quite interesting history that goes behind this stuff. But we're going to look at Microsoft interferometers in particular. And they really are um, relatively straightforward, all right? This is not going to be tough, I think, for anyone to get their heads around. Uh, it's a... <coughs> excuse me, I've forgotten my laser pointer today, so I'm going to have to use the mouse on the screen. Um, it's based around a lamp giving out <coughs> monochromatic light, all right? In this case, I suppose we're intended to believe that the light is yellow, even though the lines are drawn in red. But, hey, it's a monochromatic light source. So most modern interferometers would use a laser to produce that, right? It's the simplest way of producing a single uh, wavelength of light. So it heads inwards towards uh, what is essentially a half-silvered mirror, a beam splitter. All right, so some of that light is going to get reflected off the mirror. Some of it will go through. That's what a half-silvered mirror does. Okay, so you're going to have to imagine that, you know, approximately half the light is now going up here and hitting a normal mirror, so a mirror that's going to reflect everything, basically, and that light will come back down again. Yeah? And for the light that goes through a half-silver mirror, it will bounce off this other mirror over here and come back again. Same thing is going to happen. Some of the light that's bounced off mirror one will get reflected off this half silver mirror and go back to the lamp. We don't care about that. Um, the rest of it will go straight through. Now, likewise for this. Some of this light that's bounced back from M2 will go through the half silver mirror and back to the lamp. Again, we don't care about that. But some of it will be reflected and come down here. All right, so you can see what's happened. We've had one light source... We've split it into two <coughs> parts and then recombined it down here. At least a portion of it. Yeah? So think interference. What do we need for interference? We just need a constant phase relationship. Well, we've got one light source here. So by definition, mm -hmm. our two bits, our two streams of light, just divided up by a half-silver mirror, 
our two streams of light must have a constant phase relationship. Because they're all coming from the same place, yeah. And a half silver mirror would have been like a grating? Um, well, originally it was literally, I mean, a half silver mirror. In other words, you know, the, the, I mean, the classic mirror is a sheet of glass with some, you know, metallic coating. Thin mm. coating on the on the on the reverse side, mm. and the best quality mirrors did actually have silver coatings on the other side. It just evaporated from liquid silver basically, and it deposited on the glass. It's a very crude Hacking method. Half half. So half and half, you just do it for less time. So there's not enough silver deposited to cover the entire surface of the glass. <coughs> just approximately half of it. So the light will reach some <coughs> patches of the glass and be reflected because there'll be a patch of silvering behind the rest will not see silvering behind but will go through the sheet of glass as it would normally so it's a very you know at its basic it's a very very crude system and um, there are posher ways of doing it now but you know that that's how Michelson and Morley would have done their initial experiment um, it's the sort of thing that used to be used um, for um, you know, one-way mirrors, so in interview rooms, that sort of stuff. Um, <coughs> right, where are we? Oh yeah, okay, so from our one light source, we've gone up there and back again, <coughs> whoops, and we've gone out there and back again, all right, and recombined down here. All right, now given that we've got a constant phase relationship, what we observe down here, or should be able to observe down here, is an interference pattern. Right? A series of light and dark fringes. Because we're going to have constructive or destructive interference and all points in between. Um, depending on the physical makeup of, of this system. And we'll go on to describe that uh, on this slide. So same diagram <coughs> uh, and same process. I've just stripped off a bit of extraneous labelling to make it a bit clearer. So what we see down here is either going to be bright light or very low intensity, zero, if we've got our instrument set up properly, into intensity. All right, so it's going to go from maximum to minimum, depending on where we've made our light travel. So in other words, we've got one part that's going up here and back, one part is going out here and back. If this length is different to that length, then we've made one part of our wave travel further than we've made the other. All right, so they would have begun at this point perfectly in phase, coming from our single light source. But when they come back to here and down on this pathway, they might not still be in phase. If this distance is different to that distance, they may well not be in phase. So we're going to invoke again this thing that we talked about in the context of um, Young's double slit experiment, you'll remember. Uh, we're going to invoke this thing, the optical path difference again. And it's simply a measure of the difference in this distance to this distance. Okay? These distances here are irrelevant because they're common to both, all right? <coughs> so by definition, there can be no path length difference induced here. But if mirror two, say, is slightly further away than mirror one, then we've made this branch of our <coughs> light travel further than we've made this branch. Okay? So if we're going to get constructive interference down here at our detector, that optical path difference, which is just twice the difference between L1 and L2. Why is it twice? Because <coughs> it's gone there. I should have said it on there. Great. Silly question. Um, yeah, the light's gone there and back again. So whatever that path length difference is, if it's a whole number of wavelengths, and then we get on to the next slide, obviously, we get constructive interference. But if the optical path difference is <coughs> out by half a wavelength, 
then we're going to get destructive interference. Okay? So we can use this as a measure then of differences in position of either mirror one or mirror two. Actually, it doesn't matter which one is static and which one is doing the moving. It's just the difference in the path length that we're worried about. <coughs> so we've got this factor of two, remember, because our waves are travelling out to mirror one and to mirror two and back again. So that means that um, we can go all the way f in our interference pattern from a maximum, so constructive interference, through a minimum, destructive interference, back to maximum again. And mirror one or mirror two have only moved by half a wavelength of light. Right? And we can go all the way from maximum to minimum, therefore, half <coughs> our mirrors have only had to move a quarter of a wavelength of light. And actually with a decent electronic detector uh, in there, we should be able to map out changes in intensity much less than going all the way from maximum to all the way to minimum. So in other words, we can detect changes in the mirror positions to much better than a quarter of a wavelength of light. All right, now in the visible part of the spectrum, we've been, I mean, you know, if we look at the yellow light we've used once or twice, for instance, we're, we're looking at wavelengths of about 500, 550 nanometers. Okay, so let's assume we've got a yellow light set up here, sodium lamp or something, <coughs> powering this system. Uh, then we're going to be looking at being able to detect, detect a change in position of less than a quarter of that. So what is that, about 100 nanometers? So even doing things quite crudely, just with a, a sodium discharge lamp in the system, uh, you know, we can already measure changes in position of one of these mirrors, um, you know, to better than 100 nanometers. Right, tighten the system up considerably uh, and we can do even better than that. Um, <coughs> so, for instance, we can build one of these interferometers, believe it or not, out of fiber optic cables using all the stuff we did about total internal refraction and so on the other week. So instead of passing our light through air, we can pass it through uh, fiber optic cables. So you know, there are engine manufacturers, for instance, all around the world who use these systems to look at small levels of vibration of engine components. By using those components as one of the mirrors in an interferometer. So any vibrations in those you'll pick up by looking at changes in, in uh, intensity levels in your interference band. Incredibly sensitive, amazingly sensitive. Um, well, there are some more spooky things as well. I remember going many, many years ago um, to an exhibition of, you know, stuff, technology around handling nuclear waste, <coughs> which was quite interesting in and of itself. But, you know, you know a lot of stuff that happens with really hot waste when they're stripping cladding off nuclear fuel rods, for instance, in an incredibly hot end of the processing. Uh, everything is done inside a remote handling staff with robot arms and all that sort of stuff. Right? But you still need to be able to see what's going on, um, you know, even if camera systems fail and so on. So they usually will put in a small window of some sort. Right? And by small, I just mean small in surface area. It's actually incredibly deep. And this will be lead loaded glass for obvious reasons. It's trying to prevent leakage of radiation out of this remote handling cell. So you can have a sheet of glass maybe that thick, lead-loaded glass, just to give you some optical, you know, some visual feedback on what's going on inside the system. Um, now they wanted to get an audio feedback from inside as well, and to have that in such a way that they didn't need to breach the security, the radiation security, chemical security of the remote handling cell by feeding wires through holes in the side or whatever. So they use one of these systems to do it. You use the face of the sheet of glass, which remember is, you know, that thick, as one of the mirrors in an interferometer. 
So you've got a sound inside, it's causing absolutely minute vibrations on the outer surface of that glass window, which you then pick up by looking at changes in light intensity in the interference pattern. So the demonstration was to have a really you know, cheap, crude transistor radio sat in the middle of this remote handling cell playing whatever it was playing. Um, and you were able to listen to it because essentially it had been picked up through this interferometer and then just reconverted back to an audio signal again. Yeah. So in spy movies when they point that laser at the glass window. Exactly that. It's a Microsoft interferometer. <laughs> exactly that. Brilliant. So there is some good physics in some of those films. Uh, that's how it works. Yeah. Why sound? Why do I need to know what's, what the sound is inside? Well, again, it, it, these are fail-safe mechanisms. So mostly it's going to be done with with you know high-resolution cameras and so on. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's to have something in case those systems fail. And sound can be quite useful if you're, you know, if you're stripping off the aluminium cladding from around, you know, uranium fuel elements or something. Uh, it can be quite useful, I guess, to be able to hear the crunching, wrenching sound of the metal. Is it? I, d I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, from nuclear waste handling to uh, the work of spies, um, Microsoft interferometers have, you know, quite a lot of applications. <coughs> um, they also get used, and this is the sort of more up-to-date stuff, uh, in the context of um, looking at gravity waves. So where we've got two... Uh, two stars orbiting each other, for instance, they will, they will emit gravity waves. I mean, that's, or at least they should be emitting gravity waves if Einstein's general theory of relativity is correct. All right. So this is a this is a really neat trick uh, in terms of trying to determine whether the, even the subtle parts of that theory are are okay or not. Now, how are you going to detect gravity waves? Uh, if a gravity wave passes through the Earth, <coughs> excuse me. Its effect essentially is, is to distort space-time, so the Earth will actually change size. Right? It'll oscillate in size as the wave passes through. And so anything on the Earth will oscillate in size as the gravity wave goes through, because space is either being stretched or contracted or whatever as the wave goes through. Um, so how are you going to pick it up? You're going to pick it up by measuring small changes in the length of something. And that's where the Microsoft interferometer <coughs> comes in again. So, you know, modern gravity wave detectors that are being built around the world now are based upon using Microsoft interferometers. Now, the individual arms of this thing are going to be of order a kilometre long. Right? You need a big distance because you're, you're going to be measuring changes in length scales of, again, less than the di diameter of an atom in a kilometer. Okay, so this is a tall order. But the ones being built now uh, have enough sensitivity, enough precision uh, to be able to do that. So within the next few years, we will know for sure whether Einstein's theory is, in this respect, is, is correct or not. Yeah. Two questions. Firstly, how does that one work? Where does it right, come okay. From? No, it's worth walking you through that one. But you can see the basics. Here's the light source. Here's our half-silvered mirror. Uh, here's the detector. All right, so those components exactly as we had before. Um, all that's happened, so we've got, basically we've got a mirror here and a mirror here. All that's happened is that they've stuck additional mirrors in in order effectively to lengthen yeah, the distance the light is travelling. So it just accentuates uh, if there's a small length change in either this branch or this branch. <coughs> wouldn't matter which. And this thing is just a lens. All right? oh. This thing is just a lens. If gravity waves are thought to travel at the speed of light, and yes. light travels at the speed of light, and as it was space time itself, it would be contracting and expanding, so your equipment would shrink and grow with... How do they know... How would they detect it at all? Well, OK, because there's going to be a difference between one and the other. So the wave is coming in a particular direction. Uh, 
And these two arms are at right angles. So the only way that you'd be really messed up is if your gravity wave happened to be going perfectly at 45 degrees between the two. All right? Which may happen. But, you know, there are a lot of stars rotating around each other and various other things that are giving off gravitational waves. Um, you know, one or the other of them is going to be coming in such that it's not perfectly at 45 degrees. And all you'd have to do is wait another few weeks or months and the Earth will be in a different part of space and so that 45 degree angle would disappear even. Um, so, you know, that, that's, the, that's the theory of it, anyway. <coughs>